whether games can afford meaningful experiences and if they're relevant to digital humanities. So hopefully I will answer at least one or two of those questions. They, each one deserves quite a few hours. Um, rather than listen to me though, you could read this book where I write about it. And um, in this book I basically define games, digital humanities, new media, new heritage, culture place and some other things. Because what I was, did for my PhD, which was sponsored by Lonely Planet and the Australian government, was trying to work out how we could use virtual environments online to c culturally constrain people. So generally virtual environments 10, 15 years ago, people tried to make them as accessible as possible. And what I tried to do was make them slightly less accessible for various reasons, which I hope to explain. So I'm going to show also some uh, projects and maybe some ideas which I haven't fully finished yet. But you are free to take from them what you can. Um, so first off, my basic approach in digital humanities um, it seems to me much of the controversy or some of the divisions is whether we're serving in terms of computing whether, or whether it's a paradigm. And I, I particularly like David Parry's talk about this and I would just like to modify it slightly. I think Kuhn would be very upset that we use the paradigm for the humanities and secondly, in a way, it trivializes digital humanities because it, it shouldn't just be paradigmatic. Um, what I would like to think though is as soon as we're using computing for digital humanities, we're trying to think how it re-examines re digital humanities. Um, I don't think it is actually just in terms of servicing humanity scholars. I think it does offer something new. Um, and then I'd also like to say, in terms of Jeffrey Rockwell's very interesting paper on research infrastructure, I slightly disagree with him. He says research infrastructure, is, if you can read that, is not research, just as roads are not economic activity. And uh, we tend to forget that infrastructure projects are not an end in themselves. I like to think of it slightly differently. I think that, um, that roads are not infrastructure, but roading is. And I believe... Forward. <laughs> Sorry. <Yeah. laughs> uh, okay, I better not show that. I believe that infrastructure is only infrastructure when it's used, and personally. And uh, as an example, in North America, this farmer was asked to pay thousands of dollars to build a barn for his horses, and he was asked lots of legislation, and he was asked lots of things to build his barn. He gave up and he said, I'll just build it legally. So he built this. Can you see that? Those are full-scale horses. They're full size. So instead of building a barn, he built tables and chairs, which are slightly large, and didn't have to pay any lawyers or engineer bills. And I, I personally believe that one of the things about infrastructure is it has to be creative. Because when I first programmed my own computer game in 19... 81, 82, I didn't realize programming was hard. I didn't realize the constraints, I just did it. And I'm very concerned when we're teaching students that we take away that creativity when we build an infrastructure. So one serious problem for me is, how do we keep people creative and how do we make sure the infrastructure works for them? Having said that, I'm not gonna talk deliberately, directly about it. I'd just like to, to finish on the DH side is that um, when you're applying for the, the ERIC, not me, but the ERIC with a C, um, it actually says it has to attract top-level research, top-level research students. So there's a qualitative aspect to the research infrastructure in Europe. So I believe it has to involve qualifying how the infrastructure works, and that in itself requires research. Anyone want to question, debate? No. I'm not sure whether anybody apart from me knows what an ERIC is. He does. <laughs> It's a way of not paying tax, isn't it? Yes, indeed. Nice so, one. so basically, when you apply for it, then you can enter into a research grant as a consortium. Yeah. But they actually qualify what they, they term a research infrastructure, but it's a top quality research infrastructure. Because otherwise, this is a photograph of a mermaid at Copenhagen looking into a painting of the mermaid of Copenhagen. We'll just have empty infrastructure, and I don't think it's going to be really using anything. Um, so the questions for me in Denmark, when we have four universities and two libraries, is how can we develop this infrastructure, in our case, five years ahead, when we're not using the technology yet, and how can we use it in a distributed way, but also in a Danish way, in terms of national identity and so forth? And where should the resources go? I don't know if you know, but the, the Nordic computers are all, all actually run from Iceland. So the backbone of the Nordic computers are run from Iceland because it's much cheaper for the electricity. Um, so it's a particularly interesting question in the Nordic world. Now, on, on to my research. It does slightly relate. My research is virtual heritage. 
Um, so the, ba the basic last part of that sentence is, how can we understand cultures and times and space and understanding different to our own? And I'm particularly interested in different understanding. And I agree it's an oxymoron. Virtual heritage is kind of a contradiction in terms. Um, but it's based hopefully in part on UNESCO, who moved from what this is a, a notion of cultural heritage. And they have, they basically say the same thing for monuments and groups of building, outstanding universal value. And then on sites, they start talking about the historical, aesthetic, etc. viewpoint. So there's a slight distinction there. But it's very interesting to me as an architecturally trained person, how it's so architectural, and yet in the 1970s it moves to intangible heritage, which you have to wonder what is excluded from the notion of cultural heritage. So it's social practices, rituals, events, traditional craft personship. And what, what, strokes us, what strikes me when I looked at the UNESCO definition is how interactive it is. And it seems to me when I need to create virtual environments, I need to actually sort of define how they work for cultural learning. So I had to define this term called cultural presence. So in virtual environments, um, there's this research group called Presence, and they try to, to analyze and measure how present you are in a virtual environment. And a virtual presence normally means the sense of being there. So if you put on these head-mounted displays and you feel that you're in a place, then that shows this virtual environment has presence. There's a big debate as to what presence means and immersion means, but the basic definition is the sense of being there. My problem is that is, what is being and what is there? And in, if you want to create a, a sort of virtual experience of being in a different culture, I wanted to create a sense of being somewhere which is not here. So there is a bareness, an alterity, and an alienness to it. And it seemed to me that virtual environments over the last 20, 30 years didn't work because you're not physically embodied, you're not socially embedded into this structure. You can observe very stupid avatars, perhaps, but you're not actually part of a society. And you're not culturally inscribed. So that means you do not change the place. When you've gone, the place keeps going. And people who play World of Warcraft and other games say, no, we have a culture, we have a society, but you'll find normally when they play these online games, all the cultural interaction is actually through Skype. It's actually not inside the world. So I began to think that there was something different between culture and society. And that's why I decided to come up with this term of cultural presence. I needed to actually work out what I was measuring. Um, and there you'll see at the top, um, it's sort of a dance upon it. It was a dance class in Denmark a few weeks ago, and that is what I would actually call a social behavior, a social event. And the bottom part is the only example I know of about 10 years ago of Second Life, where a First Nations nation person in, I think it was the uh, United States, is one of the last people to speak his language, and he teaches people through Second Life. Now, to me, that's actually not cultural, though. It's actually sort of social behavior with a remnant of culture in it. But it's, it's a very interesting example of Second Life. Um, and I also don't believe that going to a place like in, in Brussels and trying to work out where to look is a sign of genuine cultural activity. It's a social activity surrounded by hopefully cultural things. Now, and when you look at virtual worlds, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to insult Second Life a bit, it's unfair. But I, I was in a virtual worlds association in Australia a few years ago where they all met in Second Life. And it seemed to me that our meetings in Second Life were like real world meetings, but even worse. It's like you took all the worst things about meetings and you virtualized them. So you can't see who was speaking. You can't see. You know, all the, um, all the ways in which you relate to other people is gone. Like actors hate virtual environments because they can't sense the body heat of the other actors. And, and they did this research 20 or 30 years ago. I, I first encountered virtual reality in a, a Japanese furniture showroom in 1991. They were using it to um, sell furniture, and you had three computers one to run the environment, one to run the head mounted display, and one to run the body glove. And the uh, environment was only 600 by 800 pixels. But when you put your hand through the water, it felt like real water. So it seemed to me 20 years ago that that was going to replace architecture, and architects didn't. But that sense of embodiment is actually very important. And you don't get anything like that in Second Life. There's a, um, a French comedian group who actually mimes Second Life, and all the actors do things like they walk like this, they bump into buildings, and um, it's just a, a show of lack of embodiment. 
The irony is, though, that Hubert Dreyfus wrote a book on the internet where he said the internet is all about disembodiment and uh, lacks a sense of community. But then someone on, his, uh, on, on the book review site on Amazon wrote, if you want to be disembodied, go to Berkeley and be one of 500 people. So there's a, a bit of tension there. Um, but I have to agree, in many of these virtual environments, you don't have a sense of your body, you can't see what other people are doing, and there's no social ranking or priority system. So the cultural and the social, to me, there's a slight distinction here. Um, in a social environment, you can talk and you chat, but you could be anywhere, and the location doesn't change the feeling of your behavior. It starts changing when you have community environments, when you have a specific hangout, when you have a regularity and a shared identity. But it's, it's strongest when it's, when it's actually ritualized behavior and there's specific places, and the environment changes because of you. And it's not just a cultural thing, it's a physical thing. So in the, in the real world, we, live, we leave traces. In a cultural world, we also leave traces. The geographer Wai Fu Tuan once said culture is a form of escape. He wrote a book on it. So to me, culture is very interesting. It's kind of a learning mechanism, and it's kind of a series of objects. It's also kind of an invisible system, and it's not quite really there. And, and in terms of building a virtual place, well, if you want to distinguish between a place and a space, it seems to me as well that there's a relationship where a place is actually created by culture, and culture in turn is created by a sense of place. But the funniest thing about places is you can be outside place. They, they can reject you. They don't have to be centers. And places can actually be emblems or symbols of other places. So they can develop uniqueness by actually incorporating other things. And the geographer, uh, Doreen Massey, has written about this notion of place and contested places. So places are actually quite complex, but they seem directly related to culture. And that's not something we have in virtual environments. The other interesting thing about virtual environments, and we've been doing studies on this, is that when we're in a virtual environment, we tend to reach symbolically, subconsciously, for tools. There's a toolness there, which is also a Martin Heidegger concept. And it's something that we don't have if we're monkeys or primates. So this is a primate brain. I don't know if you can see that. There's a couple of things missing, which we have in the human brain. So if you hold up a, what's a strange object? Am I allowed to use this? If you hold up this up to a chimpanzee, the chimpanzee can remember it, go out of the room, come back and remember it again. But if you just angle it slightly, the chimpanzee doesn't recognize it. So we have this toolness memory. We can see things in 3D and we can work it out from different angles. But the, apparently the other animals can't do that. And yet in virtual environments, we haven't really developed these tools to reflect the more complex brains. So here's a definition of, of virtual heritage. It's written um, 13 years ago. So it's all about computer technology to provide formative educational experiences. And that seems to suit, this is a technology which is in use today called Blink, which is based on atmosphere, Adobe Atmosphere. And this art historian professor in America teaches his students how to reconstruct uh, paintings, mosaics, etc., in churches. Um, and he gets them to spatially build them, and he finds that they remember them a great, a great deal better. Apparently, there's a link between spatial memory and, um, and place. And actually, there's a link between short-term, long-term memory and our sense of place because of the hippocampus. Um, secondly, though, I, I came up with a slightly different, different definition. So it seems to me we also want to know the type of people that ran something and why they were unique. So I added in social agency. We want to know why people lived, how they lived, and uh, what their values were. So some geographers, for example, when they look at World Heritage Sites, they go, it's just tourism money. But when you look at the definition of UNESCO, it actually says, these objects are outstanding universal value. So what is this outstanding universal value? It's a huge philosophical question. And it is a lot of money, but um, it's also something we should all ask, because why are these things worth saving? So, yeah, now we come back to new media. Um, virtual heritage is talking about using computer technology, and yet when it talks about new media, most people talk about CDs and records and, and, and now laser discs and so forth, but there's a book on new media, and it's called, does anyone know it? 1917, 1719 to 1945, new media. So this question of new media is highly contested. But if you teach or visit these new media things, as a teacher, the most difficult thing, probably the most challenging, interesting thing is how do you keep abreast of these things as they're being built? 
So it seems to me that we talk about the heritage, it was the name of a conference I attended, that we actually should say it's about understanding and experiencing digital media, um, what is new and significant about it. But there is a problem when we start using these new media tools. And uh, correct me from anyone who's done this, but it seems to me it's, it's too easy once you start designing them to actually try and make them as perfect and artistic and complete as possible. So the artistry takes over. And that's also possible a problem of experiments. So if you're a student and you design something and then you evaluate it, you want people to like it. You want people to like you and your skill. And there's a contradiction there. Um, these, these three are all examples of, I'd say, virtual heritage. This is a, a game engine, an old game engine, Olivia, which is a, recreated as a mod to teach people about lighthouse history. This is actually a recreation of, of the virtual experience of Malta. That's one of the oldest stone temples in the world. And you have a magic wand and you can move the artifacts around. And this is a, <coughs> a game engine of a, a monastery. And the, this team, Paladin Studios, actually set up originally as archaeologists, but now create games. So, um, no one's been asking about the London Charter, but there is a charter which talks about what makes a good virtual heritage model. But I, I thought that um, that only deals with regulations. And what's more interesting to me is, when you have these expensive virtual heritage models, how do you evaluate them as users? And so these are the points that I, would, I took away from, from looking at virtual heritage environments, which are white elephants, and simply, in terms of interaction, what can the users do? Um, are they aware of the local social constraints? So when you're in this virtual experience, do you actually feel that you're actually looking at the world from a different perspective? And what do you learn? What do you take away from it? And this is also a problem of what they call serious games. So we do learn from virtual games, but well, what is transferable about so it's a big question. What am I doing? Okay. Um, so my PhD was sponsored by Lonely Planet, and it was during the time when they found out they had virtual tourists. So in about 2001, the most requested Lonely Planet guidebook was on Afghanistan. The only problem was Afghanistan was being bombed. So they realized they had a huge armchair audience. And they, they asked me to um, create these virtual environments and evaluate whether people could learn from them and, and use them. So that's why I came up with this notion of cultural presence, because I wanted to see if people could virtually learn. And then when I looked at the virtual environments, which recreated history and heritage, I found that um, there was very little in terms of user analysis of them. And the most famous one was by Lydon Mosica, which is on Bologna in Greece, the two largest virtual heritage centers at the time. And she said that what they did was, when they recreated a Roman temple or a Greek town, they recreated it as perfectly as possible, but then when there wasn't much knowledge, they uh, just needed black spots, black holes. They didn't know anything about the building. And the people who came in about 10 years, 12, 15 years ago, put on the head mounted displays or watched the large screens and couldn't stand it. They could not stand it. So archaeologically, you had certain knowledge and they're just black boxes. But the people expected you to have an interactive film of uh, film quality, which they could just interact with in real time, and they could not stand these, these black holes in the virtual environments. So I, I looked at games instead, because when you look at virtual environments, the two of the most successful types of virtual environments are not academic, they're either um, flight simulators or commercial games. And now um, games have kind of taken over. To build a, a normal game, this is the cost of a movie in Hollywood. Incredible amounts of money are being spent on that. But to me, the interesting thing about games, in a wider sense, and not just in terms of computer games, is that they actually leave out things. They make people fill in gaps and their challenges. So when I created my virtual environments, which is very simple technology now, it's like 10, 15 years ago, I actually evaluated them in seven different things, just trying to work out what I could evaluate. And one of my biggest mistakes was I said, did you find this environment or this environment challenging? What is the problem with challenging? Anyone know? It means two opposite things in the English language. So if I find homework challenging, that means I don't want to do it. If I find this game challenging, I really want to complete it. They're two quite different things, aren't they? So it seems to me there's something very strange about games, or very universal. Games are challenging. And yet education is not normally challenging, not in that positive, nice way. So I basically decided to create, I had uh, 
70, 80 archaeology students where I tested the prototypes. And I decided to create, just to uh, make them go through into the archaeological experiments, imaginative works. So if you read these temple inscriptions and talk to the avatars and so forth, then these more imaginative recreations of the Mayan creation were opened up. And that seemed to work very well. Because when I first evaluated those 80 archaeology students, they asked me two things. And they were studying Mayan civilization. They said to me, where are the guns and can I change my clothes? My avatar's clothes. And these are first year archaeology students. So I realized I had a problem. <laughs> the second problem is, if you take a um, archaeological artifact, laser mapped or however you create it, and say it's in an archaeological environment, they won't interact with it very much. They won't know how to interact with it. But if you tell them it's in a game, they immediately pick it up and the navigation is easier. And this was even for people who'd never played a game before in their lives who were 50 years old. So I found that really puzzling. But the other, other thing is that if you tell them it's in a game, they don't believe it's as authentic or meaningful as if you tell them it's, in, it's a real world item. And the strange thing is that these Mayans, they actually had games. The games were actually their creation. So to understand Mayan civilization, you actually have to kick a large rubber ball with your knees. Um, so there's some interesting stuff going on there. And the other issue, which I still haven't quite worked out, is what happens when the civilization is so gory and horrific and fantastic that no one will believe you when you try and, try and re-visualize it. So does anyone know anything about the Mayans? The Mayans talk. Well, I'm not really a Mayanist, but I can tell you that when you take over another Mayan town, another Mayan temple city, the first thing you do is you actually rip off the fingernails of the people who paint the sculptures. So the people paint these sculptures out of red clay, etc. And when they paint the sculptures of the kings, the buildings become more, they develop more cooler, more energy. So to take over another city and make sure it never tries to get you back, you destroy the painter's fingernails so they can't paint and they can't sculpt. And then the Mayans did other things, uh, quite horrific and mystical things. They had all sorts of drug trips. There was ritual sacrifice of themselves, of the rulers. They'd slit their, uh, their throats, etc. Basically, you can't recreate all that in virtual environment for children. But also, when you try and recreate that, people won't believe you. They won't believe in the, the sky snakes that the Mayans saw. And they won't believe that the Mayans saw stars, which we didn't see until 60 years ago. So there's some fantastic stuff, some unbelievable stuff there, and I still don't know how to quite recreate that. But I found that rather than just trying to teach them about the Mayans directly, I would get the students to design them themselves. So they took my uh, Palenque models, and they put them in this game environment, Unreal Tournament, 2004, 2005. Um, and, and this one, I have a movie on it, but no sound at the moment. This one has real-time sound, which, not well, real-time, it interacts as you move through it, and there, is, there are tasks. We use the, the, the game engine navigation devices, put in the mind calendar instead, and the task was basically, as you go, go through and pick up a stick and go to the football, football court, the, the mind, Wall court, um, the earth would open up and we'd tumble through to the underworld, Zibalba. And I happened to have a book by the, the anthropologist who had written about Zibalba, the mysterious underworld, and we translated that into, a, into an imaginative world for the design students. And one of them ended up doing this full time. And the other thing I should say about this is that we, a uh, real tournament can be projected onto many computers at once. So if you know what a cave is, a virtual world, virtual room basically, Everything is projected. You can do the same with other real tournaments, so it completely surrounds you. So we had a curved mirror, and we projected it onto the floor and the ceilings and the walls at once, so the birds in the game environment would fly over you. And we gave the participants a, walk, a 3D joystick, and to walk through the game environment, they actually just walked on a dance pad, <laughs> which, uh, which was very effective. So there was no keyboard, no mouse, and it absolutely terrified some of them. So there was a recreation of a Zabalwa, the Mayan underworld, which of course there's no paintings of or direct reconstruction, it's all completely imaginative. And then one of the students also did a recreation of, of Malta, so the little visualization project, and we found that the videotaping of people was extremely ghostly, so we created these ghost avatars which would go through the temple and show you how to perhaps how to reenact the rituals. Of course, no one actually knows, even though we have the artifacts. And then Bernadette Flynn, who asked us to, to develop this prototype, she took it to Malta, and I'll show you the project that she made later on. Um, and this, all these projects were done in six weeks. 
by students who haven't used 3D computers. And then this is a biofeedback project um, in 2006, an honors project. And you could get this game, which actually, well, basically biofeedback. Light, light detectors are simple biofeedback. They read your sweat response, etc., your heartbeat. And this game, which is a new age meditation game, it um, feeds off your biofeedback through these little metal tips. And then depending on how calm you are, the ball spin around, and it's endorsed by Deepak Chopra. But what I wanted to use it for was actually temples. So if you recreate a Buddhist temple, if you're calm, then things happen. But the easiest way to see if this would work would be to actually use it in a zombie game. Um, so we took a zombie game, a uh, zombie mod of Half-Life 2, Source Game Engine. We found a very interesting thing about it. Um, you could in real time have the game shaders change, depending on people's heartbeat or skin response. So what he did was he took the mod, he created little invisible triggers in the game, and tried to work out what really scared people. Um, and one thing about humans, which you don't normally have in virtual environments, is peripheral vision. So our peripheral vision is actually black and white, grayscale. You know that, don't you? Do you know why it's black and white? Why isn't it color on the edges? Because we don't need color. We need quick response if something is creeping up on us. So try it at home. Try to work out if you can see color on your edges. You think you can, but there is actually no color there. It's quite incredible illusion of the brain. And what we tried to do was actually test this by having the zombies, when you're more scared, to creep up on the edges of your peripheral vision. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't just that. The music would change depending on how scared you were. Um, the, the screen would actually shake. And um, we tested it out. And as an indirect atmosphere, it was extremely effective. So I often wonder now if you could do like a film noir, if you're feeling particularly cynical going those black and whites. Well, if you could work out what film noir was, feeling was and biofeedback, you could do it. So is it a direct mechanism to replace the mouse and the keyboard? No, it's too inaccurate. But if you want to have the atmosphere feed off the person, then you can do it. And in this case, for example, if you feel really calm, then you start seeing through buildings. So there's all these aspects to this sort of interactive cinema, which people are only beginning to use. But the most powerful thing was music. When the music changed according to your body, it didn't matter if there was a two-second lag. It was the most powerful thing. Shape making the... Uh, computer screen appear to shake was actually just disturbing. And uh, another group took this, because I've always wanted to recreate the process and the, and the legend of the Minotaur. And we had, I bought this uh, head-mounted display, which is, I don't know, 800 by 600 pixels, so it's not a really good resolution, but that wasn't the real bad thing about it. If you moved your head around, about a second later, the head-mounted display adjusted. It was very disconcerting. So it was a very big lag on the head mounted display. And I, I said to my students, why can't we use this creatively? And I said, why can't you use this in the, the legend of the Minotaur? So you're in the maze. And you're down these long tunnels. And when you get to the end of the tunnel, we'll have these, these fans with scents on, scent on them. Because Crete is famous for its flowery scent. And it will blow on you when you reach the corner. So you know that the corner of the, of the, the maze. And also, we'll have this Minotaur, and as you get closer to the Minotaur, you'll start hearing the heartbeats of the previous players. Um, and therefore, when, when you have this lag, you turn around, and then the ca camera turns around. That'd be even scarier. Um, and so the students actually built this primitive biofeedback to actually test it. So that was fine. But then I asked these other students, um, how can we build this projection very cheaply? So they decided to test it. These are all just prototypes. They decided to test it using um, a, a free engine called Talk. And they built this tent. They sewed this tent together. They'd already sewed a circular tent with a curved mirror before. And without using the curved mirror this time, they just projected it around. And there was an outside screen for the audience. And ideally, you could have biofeedback and let the players out. But what I thought the little masterpiece in terms of embodiment was this. So they found an abandoned truck chair, and they had found an, uh, an old digital massage seat. Can you guess what they did? So they put the digital massage seat under the truck chair and uh, correlated it to the landscape 3D uh, XYZ coordinates. So when you go over bumps, you actually feel it through your chair. <laughs> it's pretty good for a six-week project, I thought. And then another student decided to take the curve mirror and uh, create open source software for it. 
Oh, it's too dark to see here. Kurt Gurr, which you can see in a shop, and this is from um, Paul Gurr from Western Australia, he uses this to project. So the projector on the screen projects onto a curve mirror and projects back. So you can fill a whole planetarium with it. So normally when you fill a planetarium, it's like a, uh, I don't know, 20,000 US fisheye lens. You could just use a couple of these 200 euro mirrors to fill the same curved surface. And when the surface is quite well curved, you often don't have any test area. You really feel that it's basically floating in front of you. So my student created this code whereby you could just change points and you could project it onto curved or irregular surfaces. And in Boston, Jeffrey Jacobson um, used part of this code to connect to Unreal and to Unity so he could also project onto walls. And if you want to test it out, you could just use a curved mirror, or maybe not even a curved mirror, and you can download the, the 3D models of Egypt and Rome from the site. But that's not getting us closer to culture. Um, there's also a TV show you might know in England called Monkey. Anyone remember Monkey? Yeah. yeah. Do you remember how it went? What was the storyline? Oh, the, the, the Buddhist priest is taking um, uh, what is it, taking something somewhere else. So this journey, Monkey is guarding, and Monkey's got a Monkey's mischievous. Yes. classic literature for Journey to the West. Yeah. And the funny thing is that they did movies and, and book versions of this for about 400 year old tale in China. It's one of the great classics. And then the Japanese did their TV show, Monkey, which was then shown in Britain with British voices. So it's a British voice dub, Japanese version of a Chinese story before the monkey goes to India with the Buddhist scrolls. And we tried to recreate that in the game. It's very difficult. We had two Australian students and a uh, Chinese student. And the Chinese student said she knew the story very well and she would be the technical expert. And I said, do you know the story very well? And so she translated it for me from the original Chinese. And then we found a very interesting thing, that um, when we tested the Chinese and the non-Chinese students playing this game, the Chinese students would say, oh, monkey needs to be more powerful and so forth. But we found that they actually didn't know the original version themselves. They just thought they did. So ongoing serious problem. What do you do in a situation like that? Um, but I also thought that putting something like Journey to the West in literature into a game is often not going to work. That's not really going to show people any aspect of Mandarin or Chinese culture. However, it was very easy to do. And the, the literature pieces were put into the diary version. This was Neverwinter Nights, which was uh, had a free mod for, for education institutes. A project I thought was more successful was using an old version of Outer Scrolls, and the students built their own proto-Egyptian temple, and the, the idea was to teach uh, students calligraphy uh, skills. So, um, and they, these ancient glyphs, you don't even have to go around the statues and read them and collect them, as you develop the glyphs, then you get more Egyptian powers. And it seemed to me that using the writing and the inscriptions is a very powerful way. And then another group of students, well actually just two students, one was Hong Kong Chinese, the other was Australian. They did several prototypes, and the one that I really liked was this. This is um, about eight, nine years ago. They took a drawing tablet and they created a Chinese calligraphy game. So you learn Chinese calligraphy by drawing, tracing over it, and it would correct you. And I thought, what, why can't we use it in virtual environments? So about three years ago, a Chinese student came to me with a mainland Chinese student who had a deep passion for calligraphy. So we started talking about Taoism and the four great arts of China, which includes Go, or chess, music, and calligraphy. And I might just show you the, the video for this. So what he did there so was he, he built these mini games in Flash, and we used a touch screen. So to learn these games, you actually have to go up and touch. We found it a very powerful experience for the audience as well. But we had to change some of the game motif. So the interface
interface was like this, and you could choose which of the four games. So they were deleting the way that the four arts of China, and then China was a musician, who was specialized in the Chinese music, and also they were playing their music for us. And it was using the paper ink flow effect on a touch screen. So, so there was music involved. Oh, let's hope it works. The instructions at the start. I'll just speed this up. And he simplified the Chinese string instrument and converted it to music so people to learn about the mood of the music in relationship to the Chinese symbols. So this is a game that you had to play using your fingers, and depending on how well you did, there were no points, but there were just graphic signs of a Chinese beauty or a Chinese ugliness. Uh, 2011, this one. So the touch, the, um, the commercial touch screens had just come out. And, and it wasn't that easy to do in Flash. So this um, tries to get people to not just memorize the characters and, and the moods that relate to them. What was that mean? But you actually had to draw it yourself. You had to choose the character and then try to draw it. So I gave you instructions. And this is him drawing with his finger on the screen. And we found it much more effective than just using a normal computer screen. So we started talking about projecting it onto fog or onto water. So you can actually draw you with your fingertips into the water and just keep the chips on. And the game that didn't work was Go. So I don't know if anyone's played Go. It's not quite the Chinese version of chess. It's completely different. And it was very difficult to explain to them, not the technique of playing Go, but the spirit of Go. It's not a question of win or lose. So, yeah, it's probably not so exciting. The other one. This, because we're trying to um, get people to understand a little bit about Taoism, the whole point is that you can read books about it, but it's extremely cryptic even for Chinese scholars. So why not create tacit games? Hmm. Why is it slow? And um, one of the most effective ones was you had to paint in, in the mood with the music. And depending on how accurate you were, were it would come up with little vistas of Chinese landscape paintings. Speed it up here. So that was similar touchscreen games. And we also created a, this is not this is but it's just amazing how quick it was. This is actually a 3D film scene. So the students had six weeks to learn a game game for another game each and put it into a movie that they could. So this one runs inside the movie, it's really good to get it. And they created an entire film scene from Kung Fu Panda from the alternative universe. So I quickly go back to a little bit of theory. So looking at all these prototypes, what seems to me is that the two top definitions of games, they're accurate in a sense. So games are systems, we'll face formal systems. But it makes no sense to the person playing. A, a definition should give you an idea of 
what is its value? And it seems to me that people don't play games because they're systems. So uh, in light of what I just told you about the problem of challenge, I think the interesting thing about a game is the challenge to the God of me. So it offers up the possibility of temporary and permanent resolution and new tactics. And I think that is the secret to a, a definition of a game. I'm still working on one. And um, when you're using a game mod, well, you could compare it to using a virtual reality environment. So you, you could model and code a virtual reality, and the scale is huge and the cost is huge, but the other problem is the technology um, becomes redundant so quickly. So at University College, uh, University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA, about I don't know, eight years ago, I, will, I went there and saw these wonderful big SDI computers, extremely powerful. But then some of the teachers said to me afterwards, we have a major problem in that our students' computers are more powerful than our SGI computers now. So what happens when you do that, when you have such expensive infrastructure? And the other problem is finding talent and maintaining the talent. And at Sheffield last year, um, they said to me in a talk, uh, after a talk, it was really hard to find and keep technical people. And I said, well, maybe you need to allow them one day of research like they do in Google. And then if they do a great application, you keep it just like they do at Google, say with Street View. And they also said, how do we find um, humanists, humanities students who know how to program? And I said, you're only thinking about half of the solution. Why don't you find IT people and corrupt them? <laughs> but um, it is difficult. So that's why my projects often prototypes or experimental designs. But the next question is, how do you start integrating it? So it's actually worthwhile for people. Um, so in terms of prototypes, the game mods are actually extremely cheap and easy and powerful, and it's good to test the creativity of the students. But um, there are all these problems with using games, the virtual heritage and traditional humanities. Uh, and the, the major one that some people might not think about is the artistic artist and the historical accuracy, but also perhaps in how much accuracy, accuracy should you have, because sometimes it actually minimizes public engagement. interrupt someone while they're playing a game and say, are you enjoying this? So how do you evaluate them indirectly? So that was one of the reasons I turned to biofeedback, because you could evaluate people in terms of their biofeedback. But I've since found that evaluating people is extremely difficult. It definitely relates to the, the person themselves. Say, for example, my PhD, I evaluated how quickly they finished the tasks, what they did, what they saw, but they actually, those people who did the best didn't learn very much. The people who were slower and didn't complete the tasks actually learned more. I found the best way of evaluating them was asking them if they could extrapolate the knowledge they learned on that archaeological site to another archaeological site. And the other problem with games is genre values. So if I manage to create a, um, I don't know, a successful Buddhist temple inside a zombie game, people only see it as a zombie game. And there's a, that problem in terms of uh, people are used to what the game originally came with. They, they're used to the conventions. I've also found that with game design, that when you teach game design students, um, they say they've got something creative, but they generally copy the commercial game that they're using. How do, there are all these reasons to use game once as well. Um, so rather than giving examples, I suggest you read this pre -book. So this is online, and it goes from this mod using the winter nights of the a depression in the street in Florida, teaching anthropological history to a sandbox game environment where you can create your own models, create your own movies. And that's what I think is one of the more interesting things about digital humanities as well, is that now you can create an instant connection to an audience with this online publication system. So there is this problem with the audience, of course, and that is, how are we talking to them and about what? And it seems to me, in terms of archaeology, that maybe we shouldn't give them the answer. Okay, I can take criticism. <laughs> we, sh we shouldn't give them the incredibly accurate proportions and dimensions, and in some cases, institutes don't want to give them accurate models. They want to keep copyright. They, we could give them simple ones to give them the, an idea of a spirit or an atmosphere. And that's what I thought was so effective about public VR. So he moved from using game mods, but he was actually using it to create KBTs, to create surround environments using a cheap game engine. And then he, at uh, Carnegie Mellon, Instructions and they use them in the museum. But then he moved to um, online projection. So, with this technology, I think he moved from Unreal to Unity. Uh, Jeffrey Jacobson and the classical scholars could involve the audience. 
So you can actually blue screen students into the, into the computer game. You can have puppeteers control the phone playing characters, or you can have the students, as in this video. Actually, they're, they're learning the plays, Egyptian Roman plays, and the game environment is basically like a 3D puppetry stage, which interacts with them. It's very effective courses in the States. And then another way is to develop hackathons. So this is the hackathon in Vilnius about two weeks ago. And there were three project teams, and they had 20 hours, basically, 24 hours to use Georgiana Library data. And what this group did, um, I think they won the public engagement prize, is they created what I call a quiz mob. So basically, you have a painting up on a screen, or maybe at a bus stop, you point your phone at it, and using the, the AI tracker, a quiz comes up, and you can play against complete strangers at a bus stop testing your quiz knowledge. And so the source code should be out soon. But I found out that this team, Code United, they've won three hackathons so far. But the interesting thing from the point of view of a hackathon is you can get humanities students and IT students together. And as long as you have free pizza, you'll get some good programmers. So some ideas, briefly. Um, one idea is um, what I would call it. Basically, there was a problem in the technology that I used. You could be connected to the internet and not realize it. So if you're in a virtual environment, you could see avatars using the same IP proxy, and then you would see them in your environment, but they would see you in their environment. And you could turn this into a learning game whereby pointing at things and saying these things, these items would appear in their world or their cultural perspective. I haven't done that yet, but that, I think that would be an interesting learning experience. Um, and, um, and I believe that some of these other ideas can help in terms of changing people from tourists to travelers to potential inhabitants, because in traditional virtual environments, we are tourists, we walk through and we see things, but ideally we get people to do things and we culturally constrain them to make them understand life from an internal perspective. And in terms of augmented tourism, sorry about this projector, this is an augmented display using second life in the real world. And this is actually a panorama map. So it's a, well, it's not a panorama map exactly. It's a, it's a 3D environment with panorama models. So about 100 years ago, uh, explorers took these beautiful stereo panorama photographs of Antarctica. And in Western Australia, they recreated them as bubbles. So as you, you just see this bubble as you're walking through a 3D reconstruction of the Antarctic house. And as you get close, the bubble takes over your screen and unfolds you. It becomes a pair. So you actually see the original photos. So you can embed historical information and a 3D reconstruction together. Um, a few other things is that rather than just use what they call augmented reality, which is really more just layered reality, we can in integrate virtual characters and stick them like into the real world using key mounted displays. Or we can do something I think is more interesting, which is audio narratives. So in the early days of augmented reality, they often talked about repositioning of the real world and the computer world, perfectly adjoined. But of course, that leaves our people without sight. So with augmented reality moving to mixed reality, we, we can start talking about people moving through and they have soundtracks according to where they are, how high they are. There was a commercial tour in Switzerland you could take with head-mounted display that also would have movies on your head-mounted display as you walk through, I think it was Basel, of these avatars coming towards you. One problem with that, though, is the lack Oh, someone's telling me to, to carry out. Um, there was lag, but there was also this interesting cognitive problem in that the uh, person doing the tour um, didn't realize what was real and what was virtual. And so he started ending up going up to tourists in a cafe saying, are you real or are you <laughs> But there are other problems with augmented reality, but we won't talk about it just now. I'll hurry up. The, the, the other idea is to actually really explore what clever thing that games do, and that's in terms of mapping. So this is new for a free, um, semi-open source game. Yeah, semi-open source well, it's, a, it's a very nice game using open source software, but it's all these platforms. And what I thought was interesting was this map. So generally, when you create virtual environments, especially in heritage and history, people have these texts that suddenly pops up about avatars and objects, and that really destroys our brain because our brain can't handle spatial navigation and reading things at the same time. 
Games sometimes do it to deliberately confuse us. They deliberately cognitively overload us. And that's another issue I have with games, is that I want to create reflective games, and games generally don't want you to think. They just want you to react. But in this one, uh, the one they use me memory maps, mental maps, micro maps, it's very interesting. So this one records, it shows you as a transparent overview all these other rabbits and whether they're hostile or friendly, they don't notice you're there. But maybe we could use this for other things as well. And it's a clever way of conveying different types of information without using text. And that might also be why uh, computer gamers tend to have less car accidents while using a cell phone. Do you know why? Because they're used to being distracted. The computer game deliberately distracts them. So they're used to handling different things at once. So it turns out they tend to be safer driving it on the phone at the same time. Very strange. And the other bit of research I think is interesting is the notion of creation of depicting rituals. I don't believe, like most people, that rituals are just repetition. I believe there's something more powerful than that. And one of the, one of the things about rituals is when you're in a ritual, it's easy to break it. And everyone is sort of socially judging whether anyone else is in the ritual space or not. You can't do that at the moment in virtual environments, I think. But using biofeedback and working in where people are really looking, perhaps you can do that. And this game, for example, Oblivion, all the uh, non-playing characters, they have their own lives, they wake and sleep, they have houses, they have trails, and they also turn and look at you when you're going through. So the head turns to the face of the computer screen and talks to you directly. And there's some degree of social presence, at least, that we can use. And you can use the little editors a lot, and you could use the little editors maybe in terms of biofeedback, so they can even tell whether you're scared or frightened or happy or sad. So yes, um, and the other thing is perhaps using Kinect. So, you know, the Xbox Kinect is actually an infrared camera, so it can tell if your leg is in front of your arm and so forth. Um, but maybe we could combine that with, say, this biofeedback here, so that the characters understand if you're really part of the role. Because that's another one of my ideas for virtual heritage, and that's what I'd call a, a cultural Turing test. So, um, with the Turing, if you um, ask a hole in the wall a question, and the answer comes back, and you can't tell if that answer is from a computer or a human, and that's perhaps a sign of an artificial intelligence, in a sense, or a human-like intelligence. So I guess, don't question me on this, it's too complex to answer. <laughs> but, okay, apart from the Turing test, which this is a simplification of, imagine a cultural equivalent. So you go into a virtual environment, you're surrounded by non-playing characters, and they're all trying to find out if you, the human, are an imposter or not. Can you see why we'd want to do that? Anyone designed a game? Anyone designed a virtual environment? Oh, I'll tell you. Designing a, a believable, intelligent character is the hardest thing. Almost never works. You build a guy, people go up to it, they talk to it. As soon as they realize it's not intelligent, it's scripted, they walk away. But in this case, it's reversed. So the scripted character is trying to find out if you're an imposter, and you're trying to be one of the locals. So by trying to be one of the locals, you actually begin to learn about the local culture. And you're not so worried about, you're not so focused on trying to work out if they're intelligent. You're too busy trying to avoid detection. If you wanted to, you could even make it more complicated by having humans in the game, so a multiplayer environment, and each one trying to work out who is real and who is not real, who's a human imposter of the local character, and then they could rattle on the human friends. Um, so there's all sorts of interesting ways of developing sort of cultural appreciation there. But the greatest thing about it, of course, is that no longer do you need to make believable AI. Um, and uh, you can also use biofeedback, you can even use mood rings, so if you, um, a mood ring actually just detects body temperature, it's real cheap, but you can make a rock wall of mood rings and sense how warm or hot or excited people are. You could also use that with the Xbox Connect, perhaps. Um, I, I think I'm running out of time, so I'll just briefly say, this Tribal Troubles is a you can download that actually teaches you a form of resource management, but potentially it could be from a cultural perspective. The great thing about Spore, although it failed as a game, is that you can actually design your own characters with this amazing innovative 3D interface. So it's an incredible 3D tool. It just wasn't a particularly good game, but designing things was extremely popular. And that's what I like about Minecraft, which is a game where you mod things. And I'm wondering, could you make an archaeological version of Minecraft so people learn how to dig and uh, recover things? There was a game about 10 years ago, Karate 2D, which taught people how to find archaeological items buried under the landscape, depending on the local resources. I was wondering if you could use Minecraft for that. I probably run out of time, I'll see if I mention this diagram. Um, I don't think this is a methodological confidence. To me, methodology is a study of methods. And 
one thing missing from games and virtual environments is we don't tend to have a methodology chapter. We often think methodology is a fancy word for method. I think methodology is a study of method. So when you write a PhD, you, you look at the field and you say there's these three methods, and this is why I chose this one, and this is why I chose that one. I don't believe this is a methodology. I believe this is a list of potential methods which humanities and IT subjects might share. But that is what we need, is actually a more critical examination of which methods work in there. And it's missing particularly in game studies at times. So I decided to try and push some of these ideas forward because one of the problems with traditional humanities is working out how do you integrate prototypes, process, with an infrastructure. I don't know how yet, so, but we're running a workshop. We're inviting the EU projects to come together and talk about everything that went wrong, everything that went right, and how we could integrate them. And there's also this conference in Marseille where we're trying to get all these different traditional heritage conferences together to write one big publication. Because the ironic thing about virtual heritage is that most of the conference papers are not archived and you can't find them. So, <laughs> very sad situation. So I said a few controversial things. And like this Tim Berner Leeds video, which I couldn't get working, <laughs> I am, I'm going to say I probably made a few mistakes, but I, I'd like to say that this is all just work in progress. I believe that games could be theoretically rigorous, but it's more important that they're engaging and people learn from them. My major problem, though, is when I use these 3D type games, how do I make them reflective spaces? And that's what I'm trying to do with my feedback. Yes, no questions. All right, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Eric, for that extremely wide-ranging and <laughs> extremely insightful um, talk. OK, we're going to keep the web stream uh, live, just so as, as you know. Um, so I'll open the floor to questions. I'm sure there will be many. No, no. I, I, I'd like to say that I get weird requests from archaeologists. One was to recreate a spade, and he worked on the excavations of the Leicester Council, so he actually did archaeological digs for the council, and he said, you don't understand archaeology until you learn a spade and you dig through that particular type of soil. Do you agree? I don't know how you can do that in virtual reality. So I get asked these difficult questions. Actually, um, that touches on the question that I was going to ask, yeah. uh, which is this kind of model of presence that you've developed. Um, and I get the sense that you are kind of looking beyond presence as a construct of the five senses and also bringing in kind of experience and knowledge and what I think you called cultural embedding, um, yeah. cultural uh, something, anyway. So cultural inscription. Cultural inscription, that's it. So, I mean, okay, I guess the five senses gives us a very logical way to delineate uh, those aspects of presence. How would you do the same thing for experience? Because, you know, there's kind of cultural experiences, all the different things that we bring to an environment in our heads. Uh, how can you differentiate those in the same sort of way? Or can you? Can you differentiate those sorts of things in the same sort of way? Are you saying how can I discount previous biases or perspectives they bring to? Or how can you account, or can you account for them as discrete kinds of presence, or, or dis, you know, in the same way that kind of the senses are easily kind of intuitive, intuitively describable? I don't know how to do that yet, to be honest. I, I would like to extrapolate from the cultural presence sense. It's basically a sense of inhabitation. So when you go to a virtual recreation, I shouldn't say reconstruction, of a site, you won't get any idea of the people who live there and what it meant to them. So that to me is cultural presence. When you go to some ruin or some person's house and you get an idea of their spirit, and you're, a, you're an archaeologist, so correct me if I'm wrong, but what's missing from archaeological publications is the detective knowledge and the imagination that you have when you explore a site. And I want people to sort of get an idea of that. And they won't always be right, of course. But one good thing about the virtual is it's not physically destructive like the archaeological. So like I think it was Schliemann who destroyed, what, so 10 civilizations on his way to Troy? <laughs> so as you dig it out, you're destroying it. But the, the archaeological imagination, which is almost like detective knowledge, I think would be potentially a very good interactive mode for a game. Um, but so that cultural presence is just trying to work out what are we trying to evaluate. So we create a 3D model, but then what's the point of it? Audience perspective point. 
Do you want them just to read the book? So I've met famous spiritual heritage people who say, this is just so they read my books because I'm the authority. Right? I don't think it should just be that. But in terms of getting rid of the biases beforehand, that's a really good one. Um, what I tried to do, the most effective valuation that I had was, I asked them these questions about what they thought was the proof they felt was a sense of inhabitation of a, a different type of people. I asked them about four or five questions and I statistically analyzed it to try and work out what the actual question was. So this cultural presence thing is still sort of mixed and gestalt and vague, but if you read the literature at MIT and presence and teleoperators, so is presence research, I think. So it's an incredibly complex subject. agrees with me now. I hope he agrees with me. But, but they were talking about virtual environments in terms of what I call social presence, not in terms of um, cultural presence. I mean, if, if you go into a, a world, of, a world of Warcraft, say there's a recreation of anger wards, and you go in there and you're dressed as a 17th or a thousand year old avatar, etc. You look like you're a local and you talk to someone else and you both go, hi, how's the nightclubs doing in Shoreditch? That's not really a cultural experience, but that's what people, people are going to do. So the point of the cultural Turing test is they're sort of forced to not be that. They're forced to get out of their comfort, their comfort shell. I don't think there's much point in creating an airport, which is a, a virtual airport, basically, where nothing can change, and you, can, well, you can't really do much because of the police. But on the other hand, how much emergent behavior should you be allowed to have? If it destroys the other people's sense of cultural presence, what's the point uh, of the site? Um, yeah, it's, it is a problem. Because <laughs> you want people to be creative about destroying other people's sense. That's kind of a libertarian political philosophy problem as well. Um, any other slightly easier questions? I'm not answering them very well. Um, I, I actually personally believe you should have different modes. So this, there are four types of gamers, like I say, I don't know. We should try and cater for them. Or maybe the people who grief uh, get found out in some sort of weird kind of cycle. But you, you could do these things. And the interesting thing about, maybe not archaeology, but the ethno side of it, is that you can take the, the magical spirit worlds of the Mayans, for example, and make that the real world, if you wanted to. Or you could contrast that. So if you want to, say, look at the perspective of the, the Aztecs or the Mayans, this anthropologist, he spoke Nahuatl and Mexican uh, Spanish, and he went to this Mexican town where they used to have witches, and they didn't realize he spoke Nahuatl. So he learned all about the, the witches which were still going in the 1920s and 1930s, because he kind of lived between these realms. And he learned how they killed each other using radioactive bat dung that they put under pillows and things like that. So it's all very complicated stuff, but you, you could do this thing with virtual reality. I'm not saying recreate astral travel, but um, yeah, you could... That's a, that's a you mentioned the London Charter, which you know, kind of obviously is very much geared at archaeological reconstruction. And how do you actually integrate that uh, level of power data into, into the reconstruction? It's not entirely clear. But if you can use virtual reality to take the recreation of societies, how would that sort of London Charter principle of, of showing the scholarly work? This is my problem with the London Charter. It's not streaming now, is it? Uh, it is actually. Oh dear, I'll get in trouble. But uh, <laughs> it seems to be one of the strengths of the London Charter is that you should do good work and refer to the London Charter. Self-referential thing. Uh, but it doesn't really talk about um, what makes it 
a useful interpretation or a not so useful interpretation. I don't see what I'm trying to do integrate the London Charter yet. So if you read the London Charter, how does it help you design a more effective or better virtual heritage environment? It maybe helps you um, document it more effectively. I think that's good. But in terms of what you're saying, in terms of in, uh, archaeological conflict and interpretation and debate, I don't think it mentions that. It seems to imply there is one scholarly viewpoint which is more correct than others. But I went to this conference by Ken, uh, by Kenzek, where she was an archaeologist at a computer architecture conference, and she said to these architects, you think us archaeologists want historical accuracy and perfect models. We don't. We want debate and confusion and interpretation differences, which is exactly what you're talking about. Hmm. And, and I actually you think... Yeah. Yeah. I personally think the public would like to see conflicting opinions. So, like in the Mayan temple, where I, I talked to the archaeologist, one of the three who worked out how to break the Mayan code, so they went back and taught the people how to read their own uh, glyphs. He had said that the Lord Pakal was 80 years old, according to the epigraphy, because he was an epigrapher. And the material archaeologist said, no, he's 25 or 27 because of carbon dating. It turned out the material scientists were wrong. Material archaeologists were wrong. But that debate between the stories and the fables, which turn out to be more accurate than the physical remains, um, I, th I think the public would like to see that debate. There are several ways you could do it. You could actually have, um, um, you could actually have opacity or time changes, or depending on the archaeological uncertainty, maybe the buildings sink into the sand or something like that. There's a paper on that. There's lots of interesting interactive methods you could try and do. Well, it's actually, it comes up with other materials. Do is like, and the, the PhD I did, I had people be a, a backpacker avatar and a local avatar and tried to work out if they realized that the Mayans were about this tall and average. So the buildings to them were completely different in dimensions and scale. Because uh, I found out when I was modeling the environment, a normal, a normal Westerner wouldn't even fit in the building. So you could maybe do something like that in terms of interpretation, like if you, were, if you inhabited the body of different archaeologists, you saw different things. I mean, there's one word that I don't think has come up yet, and that's narrative. Um, and, I mean, a narrative can be used in various different contexts. I mean, if, I, if as an archaeologist, I want to relate a narrative about a site which essentially uh, formalized my interpretation of that site and my yeah. publication or whatever, I mean, I would, I guess I would support that by reference to data and possibly to previous sources about the site and so forth. But the narrative could also be, you know, educational. It could be um, based on conjectural evidence. It could be, um, you know, it could be there to provide a kind of um, positivist presentation of my conjectures. Uh, so I guess to kind of slightly t t tilt the angle around from the London Charter way of looking at things, how would you reference a narrative constructed in a game environment to show what is inferential, what is conjectural, and what is empirical? <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, that, <laughs> you just give me a great research project. Um, you could do it in terms of the, the changes in music and changes in atmosphere, or maybe the, the 3D-ness of it changes as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I saw this wonderful game once, and uh, I'm not actually a real hardcore gamer in any stretch of the imagination, but you play this 2D platform game, and then suddenly the, this little creature, like a Mario, turns around and everything is in 3D. So you could actually have cultural perspective shifts in the game. Does that make sense? And also maybe if the archaeologist is lying or embroidering a bit, maybe the field of view changes dynamically. Because we could do that with biofeedback as well. Like we could hook you up to these little biofeedback things I, I showed you. and it could, Because the lie detector is actually just testing if you sweat more. That's why you can uh, evade them with practice. But we could put biofeedback in an archaeologist. So when they're going over a few porkies, yeah, maybe the environment starts shaking. Maybe the avatars start looking more like Westerners. I don't know. Um, difficult question. <laughs> well, it's interesting because there was actually that level of uncertainty in a narrative reconstruction. I can do it much more easily than my conventional writing. Yep. Um, and I think that's the, that's the other side of it, is that when you get into the behavior of complexity, we're still at a point where uh, somebody who's, who's master of the craft 
it also touches on... Sorry. No, I just had the same question about you linked to some of the publication. Yeah, and I wasn't entirely sure how this would function as a publication or even as a substitute for publication. Oh, in the, way, the yeah. environments. Yeah. Oh, basically with virtual heritage, you read papers and you can't see the tools they're using or the methods or... Yeah. Especially in this field, it'd be great if you could dynamically link those components. <coughs> so, and therefore, I'm still trying to work out how to do it with 3D. So you know the Carrari project where they export 3D models in PDF, you could have camera views. But I wanted to look at a different technology where you could actually input people's comments graphically into the 3D. So if they don't like a reconstruction or they think it should be a different size, there should be some way of encoding it. Mm -hmm. But then you have that problem where people will just do graffiti. But um, graffiti is a historical tradition. If you go to Istanbul, you'll see Viking graffiti on the highest Sophia columns. So they've been doing it for at least 1,500 years. In a way, in a way, graffiti and vandalism is itself a form of cultural inscription. It's like bits being chipped off Stonehenge. If it happened last week, it's vandalism. If it happened 700 years ago, it's archaeology. Yes, um, what about the badges? I understand they're disrupting Stonehenge. I'm not sure if it's vandalism or not either. Um, but you could link it, um, a project like this. So if you wanted to find out the real columns versus the made up ones, maybe you could create a portal system for that as well. I answered you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I got a bit distracted by my Australian friend who will make fun of you. Oh, Australians um, do that. <laughs> no, I, I was, because I mean, what I know of was uh, art historical projects, yeah. which basically say I could embed the image into the narrative, and therefore I can save all these long bits of. Historical publication, which are about basically describing this image you can see here, sailing boat going down the river from the left top corner to the bottom. But I wasn't entirely sure how you would be able to do that with a with a um, three D reconstruction. The way you answered that question. Now, if there's still a challenge. No, but, but can I, sorry, just to take an example, there's a uh, it's not right this week, another large Botticelli panel, and for years historians have sworn blind. That, w that it had been installed in a particular place, a building which they knew had been built there, um, and, it, and it took someone to actually build a life-size replica of it. To, to uh, you know, for, for a long time, Berenson and all kinds of you know quite well thought of um, art historians had, had located this particular spot. When they built a, somebody finally got the idea in the nineties to build a life-size replica of it, and they couldn't fit it through the door, which they knew had been there at the time, so they knew it couldn't have been in the building because it couldn't. Have Never have got it in, and so then you know, a whole range of other scholarship emerges. Yeah. So sometimes those textual analogies are not really actually very useful. And I don't know what art books you've been reading if they're sitting there describing the art. That seems rather astonishing to me. I think at this point I'm going to turn off the uh, screen. Um,